All right. Uh, welcome to CS uh, 4510 uh, 7-1. The topic of today is called diagonalization. So this is not really about this class at all. This is a digression. We need to prove and understand a lot of something else to make one small comment about something that's again relates back to the material. This is part of like an upper division undergraduate mathematics course, you know, the first few weeks of a real analysis course, which is sort of understandable to a layman, I think. It's very common to see this in popular science as something cool and good. So like Vsauce has done videos on this and uh, things like that, and I'll probably share those uh, as well. It, it, it doesn't make it harder or easier to understand, but it's just, it's more accessible, I think. So first, let me give you a definition. A set S is countable if uh, there exists F, I'll say uh, exists uh, one, two, one function F such that F uh, maps S to either the naturals or so some subset of the naturals. So this is a natural definition of countable, as in like counting it, right? A set is countable if you can like count it. You can point at the objects and then start speaking one, two, three, and so on. So... So let's do some examples. Uh, let's say S and F, S is finite. It's uh, countable, right? You just like count the objects. By the way, one to one means what? It means that uh, it maps distinct elements to distinct uh, to distinct elements. So if you have two elements such that they're the same, then it must be true that those elements were also the same, right? So. If two elements happen to be mapped to the same thing, then they must have been the same element. This is what you should use to prove the function is one to what. So finite sets are countable, right? You can count them. You can just point at the objects and say one, two, three. Okay, what about uh, the naturals? The naturals are also countable. Why? Well, what's our what's our one-to-one uh, -one function? It's the identity function. F is identity function. Right. So we take the identity function and it takes and maps a natural number to a natural number. Not only is it one-to-one, -one, but it's bijective, in fact. Okay, so what about the positive integers? So your first set might be, well, if I start counting 0, 1, 2, what about the negatives? I have to count those, so I have to like go back and I have to count them. It turns out that this is countable. You just have to like count it in a funny way. So let's say if this is our, our, our uh, integer line, this is 0, this is 1, this is negative 1, this is 2, this is negative 2, and so on. What I'm going to do is just start counting like this. If I count this way forever, I'm never going to count the negatives. So what we want to do is count like this. So I'm just going to say 1, negative 1, uh, 2, negative 2, and so on. That way, every number gets counted. I could formalize this as a function, and that function would be, I could say, let f be the function, f of 1, excuse me, f of 0 is 1, then f of 2 should be, excuse me, f of uh, 1, then what I'm going to say is, like, uh, if f of n is equal to n over 2, uh, if n uh, is even 
and then f of n should be equal to, let's see, we want the negative, and we don't want n over 2 because now it's odd. I think this is going to be n minus 1 over 2, uh, if n is odd. So this is a one-to-one -one function uh, of the integers onto the naturals. So therefore, uh, the integers are countable. Now what about the rationals? Are the rationals countable? Well, what are the rational numbers? Rational numbers are... Uh, a over b such that uh, a comma b are any integers including negatives they could both be negatives and they would cancel out obviously but that's a valid way to write a rational number and b cannot be zero b does not equal zero so i don't claim any uniqueness in this definition by the way two over two is equal to one over what but they're both rational numbers it's just how to write them this seems like there's infinitely many more of these than the integers because uh, instead of like the integers seems like twice as many naturals but this seems like infinitely many uh, subsets which are natural which uh, right I could do I could say subsets like uh, I over 1 uh, for all I for all I and n, n right that's a, clearly a subset of the naturals but uh, and I could do I over 2 for all i and n, and, and so on. So I would, have, I would have a countable number of sets, each of which are countable. And that, you might think it's not natural, but actually it is. So, again, what we're going to do is, is a similar trick. We're going to write it as a table. So we're going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And then we're going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Then at each cell, we're going to write, this is, let's call this A and let's call this B. We're going to write A over B. So this is going to be um, 1 over 1, 2 over 2, 2 over 1, 1 over 2, and so on. Right? So this is an infinite uh, two-dimensional grid of numbers. So how are we going to count them? Well, what we do, you, what you might think is like, if I start counting this way, What's going to happen is we're going to infinitely go this way. We're not going to end up um, counting them. But so we're not we're never going to reach any of these numbers. But there's a cool trick. What we're going to actually do is we're going to count them like this. So, we're going to, visually, in this example, we're going to keep taking the diagonals. The diagonals are increasing in length from each other, but they're all finite. So, if you say, well, is this number ever reached? If you try and find a, contradictin, a contradiction, you can say, ah, yes, that number is on this diagonal. And it happens after these n minus whatever diagonals. And therefore, it's reached. So every rational number is then counted. So this is countable. So this is countable. You can generalize this argument for the rational numbers to take a Cartesian product. If uh, S is countable, then, uh, excuse me, then so is S times S, which is equal to, this is a Cartesian product, right? So I'm going to say a comma B such that A, B, or an S. You can sort of diagonalize the same way. The reason I think the proof for the rationals is really neat is that 
it seems like there's infinitely more rationals, right? Given any two integers, there's a finite amount of integers between them, right? If I give you A and B, A and B, we'll draw it like this, right? There's only B minus A at most integers between them. Maybe there's enough by one there. But if you give you the rationals, between any two rationals, there's always more rationals. There's infinitely many rationals, right? You can always take the average. You can say B minus A over 2. And you'll always have, you know, you can say B plus A over 2, and that's the midpoint. That's the average. So you can do that infinitely. So the rationals are what we call dense, while the integers are not. Even given that, though, still countable. There's a there's a analogy you could make of something called the Hilberts Hotel, and this was named after David Hil uh, David Hilbert. I don't know if he came up with this or this is just attributed to him, but basically, you have a hotel uh, with infinite rooms. Infinitely many. You have a hotel with infinitely many rooms, and it's full. So it's full. Uh, then a bus shows up. So here's my uh, drawing of a bus. I guess you could make it look like the SpongeBob bus. Uh, and the bus has infinitely many people on it. draw my hotel so it goes infinite in that way and this bus goes infinite in that way so bus uh, shows up well the hotel is full quote unquote but they need to put these people somewhere. So what do you do? You say, okay, if you're currently in the hotel, uh, if uh, you are in room I, move to room 2I. So everyone packs up all their stuff and they move to the room that's double their number. Well, now the ha hotel is only half full. So then everyone in the bus goes into an odd-numbered room in the order that they come off of the bus. So the hotel, is it really full? You know, you can fit another infinite, you can fit infinitely more people in it. It's an interesting little thought problem. It begets the question, though. Uh, talking, I wouldn't define something if every set was countable. That's just bad linguistics. So... Uh, does there exist an uncountable set turns out yes uh, the reals so the real numbers are uncountable What I'm going to prove, actually, is a weaker form that the interval of the subset of the real numbers is un is uh, uncountable. So uncountable means it's not countable. So 0, comma, 1, possibly contain them, it doesn't matter. Those are just two elements, right? And then we can use this to uh, prove other things. So first, the pictorial way, which is what we're going to do is uh, suppose to the contrary, the unit interval was countable. Then there exists F, uh, which takes the real numbers. We'll take we'll takes our interval zero comma one to the naturals and is um, 
one to one. So I'm going to say write each uh, as a decimal in a list. So each real number can be represented by an infinitely long decimal of digits in any base except one. So base 2, base 10, whatever. Because it's a... Uh, because each element is less than 1, we can write them as a trailing... As a... As they start with a 0. So... And because they're countable, we can write them in the list in the order, right? So this would be like f of 1. This would be like f of 2, and so on, right? So let's say 0, I don't know, 7... Eight, nine, one, you know, several point, and these are infinitely long, right? This is eight, two, one. This is going to be, I don't know, one, 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 and this is going to be zero, 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 three, whatever, right? Suppose that there is a way that, suppose to the contrary, this function exists. Consider the diagonal this is hence the name diagonalization as a number so it's going to be 0 0.810 all right dot 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 uh and so on Take this and add something to it. So add 1 uh, mod 10 uh, to each digit. So then we get the number uh, n is equal to 0 point, except the first digit, 9, 2, 1, dot, dot, dot. This is clearly... Uh, an element of the interval. So n should be inner interval. Clearly. Uh, which implies there exists uh, some index. There exists i such that i equals, you know, f of n. So f maps n some to some some count some index right it's counted somewhere, but for each index it differs in the nth digit. not one factorial by one, right? So if you consider some i, well, what's the i-th digit of n and what's the i-th digit of i? It, they're going to be off by one. So therefore, there is no i. So there does not exist i. Which implies that f is not uh, one to one. Uh, since this is true uh, for all possible functions f, the interval zero comma one is uncountable. Wow! So we have a set which cannot be proved, which we can't count. Intuitively. You know, the naturals are obviously countable. You point at them and count. But the real numbers, it's not obvious what a next is. You know, it's like trying to count water flowing through a stream. It's just sort of divisible infinitely. You don't, there's not, it's not clear what a next element is. 
So the real numbers are not countable. Now we only did a, a unit inter interval, but we can map uh, a bijection, right? And we can preserve the uncountableness through this bijection. Uh, zero comma. Actually, I'll have to do it this way. Zero comma one to uh, r by the uh, function. So I'll say f goes this way. So that f of uh, x is equal to 1 over x, right? So then th this is clearly bijective, so it's fine. So to generalize this a bit, we say uh, the cardinality of a set uh, is essentially its size. It's just a generalization of the idea of size. Is a uh, generalization so uh, if S is finite The cardinality of S, we write it, we write it exactly like the size, is its size. So that doesn't change anything. If I write it over here, I, I have plenty of room. If uh, S is countable, uh, I'll say countably infinite, because finite sets are countable. So it's, but it's this is an infinite set which is countable. If S is countably infinite, then the cardinality of S, we write this as, let's see if I can write this, as Aleph null. So this is like a German or a Hebrew letter, I don't quite remember. This is what it corresponds to. If S is uncountable, the size of S is equal to uh, Aleph 1. So it may be obvious to you that we can take the opposite of our definition of cardin uh, of our definition of countable, and we could say um, that uh, that uh, S is countable. If uh, there exists f from uh, already over here. If there, if there, if there exists f from the naturals to our set S, uh, which is onto. So basically, we can count the elements of S. That's that's really what that means, and it's equivalent to our definition of countable. Okay, let's apply uh, some of what we've made to give you a list of theorems which may help on homework and things like this. So, uh, theorem, the union of countable sets is countable. So basically what we're going to do is like count them at the same time, right? We're going to alternate counting them. So, uh, let uh, let's just say a comma b be uh, countable. So we know they're countable. So then there exists a way to count them. So there, uh, then there exists. I'll use the first definition of countable. There exists f comma g, which are one to one. From so f takes a uh, to the naturals. And uh, G takes uh, B to the naturals. Then uh, let's let uh, consider A union B, right? So we want to count this in some way. We can. What we can do is we can say F G. I guess H is the next letter. So we can say H of X is going to be equal to two F of X uh, if uh, x is an a 
or doing the sort of the Hilbert Hotel style thing, right? Or it's going to be equal to 2 g of x plus 1 if uh, x was in b. So let's prove this is injective, right? So suppose, uh, suppose that h of x equals uh, h of y, and we uh, all right, want to show that x equals y, right? So that it is injective. So suppose h of x equals h of y. If uh, x comma y in a, if they're both in a, then because a was one to one, the, then they must map to different elements. So then it's true that then that x must equal y, right? If h of x equals h of y, because then they're both. Uh, here I'll write it this way: if x, if x and y are both in a, then h of x equals h of y is equal to two f of x uh, is equal to two f of y, and then f of x must equal f of y, but since those are one-to-one, -one, that implies that x equals y. So it sort of reduces to f uh, to the fact that f is one-to-one. -one. So if x, comma, y are in b, same argument. Right? So if uh, x, comma, y in uh, a, let's say x and a, in a, a y in b if x is in a and y is in b then h of x is even h of y is odd so how can even it even be odd so this could never happen it'll never be the case that h of x equals h of y so therefore uh, the union of countable sets is uh, is countable. So, we did a union of two sets. A countable union of countable sets. Is countable. So, what on earth is a countable union? Well, there exists uncountable unions. Consider this. The union of, for all x in the real numbers, the singleton containing x. Well, this is clearly equal to the real numbers. But we took a union here of finite sets. In fact, each set has one element. But the fact that we took an uncountable union, this is called an uncountable union, uh, gave us an uncountable set. Right? So a countable union means that the index which the union goes through, if you think of it like a for loop, that has to be countable. It has to come from a countable set. So I'll write it. Not countable. Uncountable union. So a countable union must come from a from it must index by a countable set. Okay, to prove this, I'm just gonna quickly compose uh, several functions. So, um, let's see. Let uh, let's say let's say this way. Consider. The union of, uh, let's say, some i in a set A of S i. So A is countable. I is S i. So each S i is countable. So there, so there exists uh, F i which maps SI to the integers in a one-to-one -one form. It's one, two, one.
So, uh, and A is countable as well. A is countable. So first I'm going to map uh, the naturals to uh, the Cartesian product of the naturals. And you can use this by the diagonal argument we did for the rational numbers. Then I'm going to map this uh, to A uh, times N because A is countable. This is true, right? Do you agree we can... that? The, so let's call this... Uh, this is the obvious one. This is, let's call this uh, G. So G is clearly on to, uh, excuse me. So G is clearly one to one. We have, a, we have a countable set to a countable set, right? But I claim that this is equal to what? It's the union for A in, for I and A of the uh, natural numbers each, right? We just sort of take each index. And then we can map each of these to the union of... Uh, we can map each N in each un union to the F. Excuse me, to, its, to the SI. So this is going to be uh, SI of I and A. Right? So we have a composition, uh, an onto composition... Of onto functions, so it's onto, right? So what we have is uh, this implies that the countable union of countable sets is countable. You do not have to worry about this proof too much. You can just sort of freely use it uh, without worry. You know, this is a low-level set theoretic detail that most people gloss over. So let's do an example. I'm going to give you three or four proofs of this. Uh, finite sequences. So finite sequences of N are countable. I'm denoting this as N. What else? Star. So each sequence itself is finite. So there's several ways to prove this. Let's uh, do the sort of the for the sort of proper way, the sort of Cantor's way. So, n star is equal to what? Well, what we can do is group each uh, sequence into a set, but depending on its length. So this is equal to i equals one to infinity of n to the i. So what this is n n to the i is uh, sequences of length i. Sure, this technically excludes the empty sequence, but I don't care. Uh, so if each n i is countable, Uh, then we have a countable union. Well, clearly n to the 1 uh, is countable. n squared is countable. We prove we we by the same argument we gave that the rationals are countable, right? You just sort of trail along the diagonal in this way. Then n cubed is what we didn't prove this is countable. This, but this is equal to n times n uh, times n. So what we have is a Cartesian product of a countable set and a countable set. So it's countable. We can keep going this way. Another argument we could make is. Uh, uh, What's an onto uh, function from n uh, times n to n? 
There are several. I'm, so a classic one is like 2 to the A, 3 to the B for... Uh, all right, this way. So f of a comma b is equal to 2 to the a, 3 to the b, right? That's, a, that's on to, certainly. There are others you could do, but this is an obvious one. So each Cartesian product of countable sets is countable. It's therefore, each ni is countable. Therefore, we have a countable union of countable sets. Therefore, n star is countable. And that's and we're done. So this is the sort of Cantor's way of, of doing this this question. So finite sequences of integers are all countable. Uh, here's a sort of Godel's way. So Godel's way. So what we're going to say is uh, for each, we're going to just explicitly construct the maps for each sequence. What we're going to do is define uh, a mapping from uh, each sequence to a natural number in an onto manner. So uh, let f of a, b, c, whatever, how many parameters, it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, let's call this, let's say this is equal to 2 to the a, 3 to the b, 5 to the c, and so on. So this is equal to so to write it more explicitly, if uh, S1 to SK uh, is a sequence, map it to uh, the product. So let's call this whole thing uh, S, right? So f of the sequence s is then equal to the product of the ith prime to si, where i equals 1 to k. So integer factorization is unique. So this function is onto. So What does that mean? To be more explicit, uh, if, like, let's say there's two sequences A and B, if F of A is equal to F of B, then these are numbers, right? So what we did was we could say that, okay, we have 2 to the, let's say, A1, 3 to the A2, 5 to the A3, and so on. This is equal to 2 to the B1, uh, 3 to the b2, 5 to the uh, b3, and so on. But the number of 2s, the, the, the prime factorization here is unique. So if these numbers are equal, let's say this was 2 and this was 4, that can't be possibly true unless ai, a, uh, AI equals bi. Then uh, for all i, uh, ai equals bi implies that uh, a equals b. So the sequences are the same if they're uh, this map that Godel produces the same. This is what Godel used to map certain strings to numbers, and then he did something else with them. So this was the original Godel uh, numbering. Now, those are this is two ways to do this problem. Okay, I have a better way. This is sort of a, a cynic a cynical way. The jokerfication way, right? So, uh, consider two sequences. Two distinct sequences. A comma B. Let's say our sequences are uh, 3 comma 20. And uh, let's say our other sequence is 2 comma 3 comma 4. Right. So just take a second and think about these two sequences are distinct. But why? There's something in your brain that looks at them and it says they're different. And usually when I ask people this, I'm like, why are these sequences distinct? And they always say something like they have different length. And then uh, the first digit is different. Or the sum of the digits is different. 
or something like this, and they're always wrong. I'm always looking. I'm looking for a, a, a much dumber answer. I'm looking for the answer that maybe a five-year-old could give. Right. So take a minute, pause the video, and think about why do these sequences? Why are these sequences different? Okay. The correct answer is that they look different. Okay, so then just take that as our map. F maps A to A. It just converted to a string. You can represent it as a string. So it's countable. That's it. You just sort of look at it and you count it. You're like, okay, these are different. Therefore, they're countable. You couldn't do the same with real numbers, obviously, right? So another way to argue this is that uh, f of the set of sequences is a subset of sigma star. Right? Sigma star is countable. So this is countable. That was a very easy way. Uh... Here's another way a student did in office hours last semester for this problem. Don't remember her name. Uh, let's say student's way. But it was correct. So, uh, let AI be the set of sequences which uh, sum to i. So clearly then, uh, each sequence must sum to something. So n star is then equal to the union of i equals 1 to infinity of a to the i. So each ai, not only is it countable, each ai is finite. There's a finite number of elements. Recall each, each element of the sequence is positive because these are natural numbers. So like a1, uh, a1 equals just 1, right? But then a2 would equal what? We have 2. So these are sets. 2, 1, comma 1. And the indexes are also distinct, so 2. So excuse me. I guess that's it, actually, for that one. 3, there would be like, you know, there'd be 2, comma 1, uh, 1, comma 2. A one comma one comma one, and then a three, right, and so on. So we have a countable union of finite sets, so it's countable. So these are some of the many techniques you can use to prove that a set is countable. To prove a set is uncountable, is uncountable, really only two ways. You have diagonalization. which is probably the better way. And two, you can use this trick. If uh, A is a subset of B, then uh, the size of A must clearly be less than or equal to B, right? Including cardinality. So uh, if A is uncountable, excuse me, not countable, uncountable, and uh, B and A is greater than or equal to B, then that must imply that B is uncountable. So, uh, to prove that B is uncountable, find an uncountable subset 
of b. So uh, you could find a, a subset of something that maps to the real numbers, right? So I specifically gave you finite sequences uh, as countable sets, but consider uh, consider the infinite the set of infinite sequences, and we're going to denote this by n infinity. A set of infinite sequences. You can imagine an infinite sequence can sort of correspond to the real number, right? So what we can do is, uh, let's do the first way first. So let's do diagonalization. So, uh, again, suppose to the contrary, there exists F, which is, which, uh, I'll just, I'll write it mathematically, which, uh, maps, uh, each sequence to some index and is onto, right? So then I'm not going to do this one visually. I'm going to try and do it mathematically. We want to make a sequence uh, where we modify the ith entry of the ith uh, thing. So we'll say let f of uh, i comma j be the jth entry in the sequence i in the the jth entry in the ith sequence Right, so consider. I actually should have put the J here. I think that would have been made more sense visually. Consider the sequence then uh, F of I to the I comma I plus one. Well, I'll say it this way. Consider the sequence. Uh, where the ith digit equals uh, f of i uh, at, uh, at the ith sequence at the ith digit plus one. So the way I could write that is, I guess I could write that as this, right? So this is a valid sequence. Clearly, this must it's a sequence, so it must be an n. It must be an n infinity. Since it's, since it's a valid sequence. Since it's a valid sequence. So uh, then it must have some index. It must be counted. by uh, our assumption to the contrary, right? So let's say K. Suppose K. Uh, but then uh, the Kth digit of the Kth sequence must then equal to, let's call this... Uh, But then the kth digit of the kth sequence is the kth element in our sequence. But this we know by definition is equal to f of k to the k plus 1. So what we have is that f of k to the k 
plus 1 is equal to f of k to the k. There is no universe this is possible. A contradiction. You can sort of visualize the diagonal in here, but I did it without the diagonal. Uh, just to, as an as a, as a exercise in rigor. So, now let's think about how to find an infinite subset of it, which uh, would map to the reals. This is a little trickier. I think instead of the infinite strict subset, I'm just going to choose the infinite subset itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to map... Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is actually map... Uh, the unit interval to each sequence. Right, in a one to, in a in a one to one way. And that'll imply that the size of the unit interval is uh, less than or equal to the size of the excuse me, the cardinality of the set of infinite sequences and therefore this must also be uncountable because we already proved this is uncountable. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, for uh, x in 0 comma 1 produce a decimal x so write x as a decimal string so let's say it's x uh, zero point uh, a b c d and so on so x equals this it's clearly less than this um, and then I'm just gonna map this to the sequence a b c d so this obviously is not going to be every sequence, by the way, right? The sequence uh, that might start with 11 will never be mapped. So then the image of the set, uh, 0, comma, 1, is a strict subset of uh, the sequences, which imply that, and it's since f is 1 to 1, this implies that uh, the set of infinite sequences is uncountable. Because these mappings like don't really matter, if I was maybe more in tuned at the moment, I could figure out a way to map this in a one-to-one -one and onto way. I can map it bijectively, and that would certainly prove uh, that it's uncountable. But this is just two techniques you can use. If I say uh, if I say prove something is uncountable, you should look to diagonalization first. If I say something is uh, prove something is countable you should look to any of the possible techniques that I've given you.